So we have some breaking news about as big as this banana. First of all, unfortunately, the Starliner astronauts that are still up at the ISS are going to be there even longer. I really didn't see that coming, and at this point, I'm starting to get worried about the long-term health effects for Butch and Sonny, who originally planned only to be up there for eight days, and now it's going to be more like 10 months. Also, great news for Starship fans and a good sign that the FAA is doing a good job at increasing its efficiency. The FAA has issued the license authorization for Starship's Flight 7 well ahead of schedule. This was also a surprise, so let's get into it. Well, first up, let's talk about Butch and Sonny, who are both in their 60s, and they've been at the ISS now for several months They went up there in June. The Boeing Starliner spacecraft came back in September without them, and they were scheduled to come home in February. But we learned yesterday that they will remain in space now until late March or maybe even April. So why is their stay getting extended even longer? Well, apparently there have been delays in preparing a new SpaceX Crew Dragon for their return. And NASA commercial crew posted on X that Crew 10 is now targeting no earlier than late March 2025 to launch four crew members to the space station. So essentially, they need more time to process this new Dragon, and that spacecraft is set to arrive to the company's processing facility in Florida in early January. So what do we mean by processing? Well, apparently, fabrication, assembly, testing, and final integration of a new spacecraft is a painstaking endeavor that requires great attention to detail, according to Steve Stitch, the manager for NASA's commercial crew program. Which, you know what, listen, it's good. We would rather be safe than sorry, but I'm sure that this is probably getting to a point of being disappointing and frustrating for Butch and Sonny. Yes, they're astronauts. Yes, they love to be in space. But they have families and and lives here on the ground. And I, like I said, I'm mostly worried about their uh, recovery and, you know, readjustment coming back to Earth because they are older. And so this is, you know, the longer they're up there, the harder the return and transition is going to be. And no, it's not like NASA and SpaceX just decided this on a whim. Apparently, they assessed various options for managing the next crewed handover, including using another Dragon spacecraft in manifest adjustments. But after careful consideration, the team determined that launching Crew 10 in late March following completion of this new Dragon spacecraft was the best option for meeting NASA's requirements and achieving space station objectives for 2025. And so remember, the SpaceX Crew 9 astronauts are up there now. Two of them did not get to go on that mission because Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore will be taking their seats on the ride home. And all four of them will return to Earth following the arrival of Crew 10 to the orbital laboratory. This is what's called the handover period, and it allows Crew 9 to share any lessons learned with the newly arrived crew and support a better transition for ongoing science and maintenance at the complex. Okay, so it would really be great to hear again from Butch and Sonny. Um, You know, I really am curious what they feel deep down inside. I don't think that we're going to get their real candid feelings for a while. But, you know, at least it's not too much longer. And, of course, if it's a new dragon, it's actually great. They're adding another one to the fleet, and we'd rather be safe than sorry. But I do feel bad for them um, that they're going to be up there even longer. There is so much going on in the space world, it can be hard to keep up. And as a journalist, you have to have good sources, but we know the internet is full of bad actors. The best tool that I've discovered to verify sources of information and get all sides of any story is from today's sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is an app and website that gathers news articles from more than 50,000 sources from around the world in one place so you can compare how different outlets cover the same story. And it was actually founded by a former NASA engineer who saw the need for more transparency in media coverage. As a former TV news reporter and anchor myself, I think this tool is invaluable because it arms you with the knowledge to become a smarter news consumer. So follow along ground.news slash Ellie. For an example, let's look at this article, Mysterious Odor from Russian Spacecraft Prompts ISS Precautions. Comparing coverage side by side, we can see that it's been covered by over 60 news 
sources, with the majority coming from center-leaning publications. We can also see that collectively 79% of those are rated as highly factual. Taking a closer look at the headlines, we can see that the left employs alarmist language such as foul stench and suggests urgency with immediately close the poise catch, framing the incident as a potential crisis. The center critiques NASA's reassurances, emphasizing distrust and highlighting a history of Russian space issues, thus presenting a more skeptical tone toward government narratives. And it's well worth reading through how headlines differ on the same topic, even with something as simple as this story. It's a great tool in today's new age of misinformation and clickbait, making sure you get access to different viewpoints in one place so you can get the full story. Check them out at ground.news slash Ellie and use my link to save 50% on the same vantage plan that I use to get unlimited access to all their features. All right, now let's get into this Starship business. Well, yesterday the FAA sent me a press release and uh, we have some really good news. The FAA has issued its license authorization for Starship Flight 7 And this is a license modification authorizing SpaceX to launch multiple missions of the Starship Super Heavy vehicle on the Flight 7 mission profile and vehicle configuration. So the FAA has lit a fire under its you-know-what. The FAA determined SpaceX met all safety, environmental, and other licensing requirements for the suborbital test flight. Quote, the FAA continues to increase efficiencies in our licensing determination activities to meet the needs of the commercial space transportation industry. This is according to the Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation, Kelvin B. Coleman. Quote, this license modification that we are issuing is well ahead of the Starship Flight 7 launch date and another example of the FAA's commitment to enable safe space transportation. So they say well ahead. We've heard the date no earlier than then January 11th, will this be the actual date for the launch? Um, You know, it's unclear. I really don't think that they're going to launch in December. And so I think that the third week of January, second or third week, is probably a pretty good, reliable date. So let's talk about the Flight 7 mission profile. It involves the launch of the combined Starship Super Heavy vehicle from Boca Chica, Texas, and a return to the launch site of the Super Heavy booster rocket for a catch attempt by the launch tower and a water landing of the Starship vehicle in the Indian Ocean west of Australia. So same old, same old for, you know, five and six, although six, we obviously didn't have a catch. And so this is interesting to note additional license information. The FAA lays out some test-induced damage exceptions. So what does that mean? Well, SpaceX identified test objectives associated with certain flight events and system components of the Starship vehicle. The FAA evaluated each exception as part of flight safety and flight hazard analyses and confirmed that all public safety requirements have been met. The five approved test-induced damage exceptions include failure of the thermal shield during high heating, failure of the flap system during high dynamic pressure, failure of the Raptor engine system during the landing Starship burn, failure of the Raptor engine system during in-space demonstration burn, and failure of the super heavy systems during post-booster catch vehicle safing. If one of these scenarios occurs, a mishap investigation will not be required, provided that there was no serious injury or fatality, no damage to unrelated property, and no debris outside of designated hazard areas. And regarding the controlled or uncontrolled Starship vehicle entry... The Flight 7 license authorization also includes the option for SpaceX to conduct a controlled or uncontrolled entry of the Starship vehicle, but SpaceX must communicate a decision to conduct an uncontrolled entry to the FAA prior to launch. If SpaceX chooses an uncontrolled entry, the loss of the Starship vehicle will be considered a planned event. A mishap investigation will not be required for an uncontrolled entry, provided there was no serious injury or fatality, no damage to unrelated property, and no debris outside the designated hazard area. So there you have it. Um, that's really good news. And I'm, I'm really happy to see the FAA sort of already making some changes even before uh, we have the Doge Department of Government Efficiency, you know, coming into play. And so also just a little side note, I don't know if you remember all the drama with the CCC, 
not the CCP. The California Coastal Commission was voting to restrict a proposal to increase launches at Vandenberg Space Force from 36 to 50 per year. And apparently um, the U.S. military is saying, uh, LOL, we're going to override you. They, uh, The Pentagon is coming in, and they're preparing to increase SpaceX Falcon 9 launches to not just 50 per year, but 100 per year at Vandenberg Space Force Base, um, despite the California Coastal Commission voting to restrict them. And before you feel too bad for the CCC, they publicly cited Elon's political views as a cause for concern when this, these are, you know, national security missions out there. Um, so that was definitely a conflict of interest. And uh, this isn't going to happen overnight. The Department of the Air Force has now kicked off a federal process to examine the environmental effects of expanding Falcon 9 launches from the base. The overall launch cadence for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy at both slicks or space launch complexes combined would be 100 launches per year. And it's not like they can just snap their fingers and have this happen. The process still calls for the U.S. military to to hold meetings and give the public a chance to comment on the increased SpaceX activity. But I did post about this. I thought that it was interesting that, you know, they denied this increase of just 36 to 50. And now they're going to have, you know, probably 100 launches per year. Um, I said, nice try, CCC. And Elon Musk commented on my post saying the coastal Karens can go suck eggs. So, <laughs> woo, he was feeling a little spicy. He commented that at like three in the morning, though. So, you know, sometimes we get a little loopy after 2 a.m. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this space update. I have plenty of videos behind the scenes that I'm working to edit. It seems as though viewership has gone down a little bit this month uh, for the holidays, which is a bummer because I really have some interesting content for you guys. So hopefully you're able to um, have it reach you. But if you've watched this video and made it to the end, thank you so, so much. I hope that you're having a great holiday season and I really can't wait for next year. I think I'm going to be busier than ever. Mm -hmm.